Welcome to Brias Medical and our head office in Sweden. Here at Brias Medical, we design all our products to fulfill our vision of providing innovation for a better breathing and quality of life for respiratory patients. In the past year, we've launched 10 new products in ventilation, bi-levels, airway clearance and sleep therapy, which together with our new connectivity solution, form an integrated system for treatment, monitoring and telemedicine. We have top-of-the-line production facilities in Sweden, USA, UK and China. But why do we go to work every day? It's because of the difference we can make in patients' lives, such as Amadeus, who depends on his ventilator 24 hours a day. It's a large responsibility, but very rewarding. For more information, please visit our website, brias.com, and don't miss all the free educational material on educationbybrias.com. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are attending these webinar series. This, it's my pleasure to welcome you on this first of a monthly series of webinars. So we will run a webinar like this every last Thursday of the month. The sequence which you will uh, see for these webinars are one airway clearance webinar, followed by two webinars around ventilation, again a webinar on airway clearance, and we'll move on like that throughout the year. The recording of these webinars will be available on educationbybreas.com. For this webinar, you will be able to send in your questions on the chat. So on the top bar of your uh, screen, you will see a logo, an icon, where to put in your questions. We will collect these questions and Michelle will answer them at the end of the webinar. So it's my pleasure to hand over to Michelle Chatwin, who is the speaker of our first webinar. Michelle is a key opinion leader and expert in ventilation and airway clearance. And I'm happy that Michelle is willing to share with us how to use airway clearance in NMD and give us the state of the art. Up to you, Michelle. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Carl. And I am so honoured to be asked to deliver the very first webinar and would like to thank Briaz for asking me to do this. For those of you that know me, you'll know that airway clearance in neuromuscular disease is a particular passion of mine. And I hope that today's lecture and presentation helps to improve your knowledge base and in ultimately improve patient care. This is an area that I still clinically practice in, and I'd like to highlight I couldn't have given this talk without. Acknowledging my co-authors who are pictured here, who were part of the ENMC workshop in 2017 on airway clearance techniques in neuromuscular disease. This group of individuals is truly multidisciplinary and in the workshop, we had patient representation. From the workshop, we produced a workshop report and the state of the art review. I urge you if you have any queries or would like to look at anything more in depth that I have gone through in this presentation to go to these papers. So without further ado, let's look at secretion movement because normally we will produce around 20 to 30 mils of sputum a day. This is cleared naturally via the mucosillary escalator, which you can see working here. It beats at 10 to 15 hertz, and something as simple as a common cold, as seen here, will affect the mucosillary escalator, and this could be further affected by disease. The mucosillary escalator is also affected by sputum viscosity, the depth of the liquid layer, elasticity, airflow equilibrium and of course the position of the airway and any effects that gravity have on it. When we look at secretion movement, we know that it's enhanced by breathing. The cephalad airflow bias is a factor in moving mucus during normal ventilation. 
the diameter of the flexible airways increases on inspiration and narrows on expiration. And what this does, bearing in mind we have similar inspiratory and expiratory times and volumes, the narrowing increases the linear velocity and the shearing forces within the airway, creating a cephalad airflow bias and helping to move secretions from the smaller airways and is also a factor in the larger airways. It may be amplified by deeper breathing and it may be amplified by coughing. Let's just look at this in this cartoon. So if we look at B, we can see that when we breathe in, air gets above the mucus because the airways are expanding and passes past. And as we breathe out, there is pinching or narrowing of the airways, which causes the airflow to increase the linear velocity forces and the shearing forces and move the secretions up towards the mouth. As physiotherapists, we always try and enhance secretion movement, and that's achieved by generating a higher expiratory than inspiratory airflow bias. And what we're aiming is for that peak inspiratory flow to expiratory flow. So the peak expiratory flow bias to the peak inspiratory flow bias to be greater than 1.1. Let me try and explain that to you um, graphically. So what we have here is we have a cartoon of a mechanically ventilated patient. You can see that above the line is the inspiratory flow and below the line is the expiratory flow. Point A is deemed to be the peak inspiratory flow bias and B is the expiratory flow bias. And this diagram shows that B is greater than A, so our expiratory airflow bias is greater than our inspiratory airflow bias and that will enhance secretion movement. It's also affected by collateral ventilation. So what you find is naturally during normal tidal volumes that the channels of Lambert and the pores of Kahn are closed because resistance within these airways is high. However, taking a deep breath in allows us to overcome the resistance within these small airways getting secretions to open up and get past these blockages of secretion and moving the air moving the secretions with the airflow up towards the mouth. When we look at the aims of airway clearance techniques, they are to improve mucosillary clearance, to increase expiratory airflow and volumes, to decrease mucus plugging, and decrease the local inflammatory response by the removal of secretions that contain bacteria. Louise Lanafors described this as a four step process. Firstly, what we need to do is we need to get air behind the mucus to open up the airways. We then need it to unstick or loosen the secretions from the small airways and then mobilize the secretions through the larger airways so that they can be cleared with a cough. And we can split this into peripheral airway clearance techniques or proximal airway clearance techniques. And so we have proximal airway clearance techniques which may be determined cough augmentation and peripheral airway clearance techniques which are sputum mobilizing. And I'm going to start by looking at sputum mobilizing techniques in neuromuscular patients. There's minimal evidence base in these group of patients, but they can be very useful in patients that are weak. If we look at percussion, we have a cupped hand and we're rotating around the chest. And what this is aiming to do is produce oscillations within the airway so that the secretions can be moved. If we look at vibrations, usually it's coupled with a deep breath in, but what we're doing is we are increasing expiratory airflow. And then I breathe in and breathe out. And from animal studies, 
we can see that this increases our expiratory tidal volumes. The active cycle of breathing techniques is a technique that involves us breathing at different um, volumes. So initially we will be breathing at a normal tidal volume, which is called breathing control, identified by BC in the left hand graph. There is then a series of deep breaths in, which is the TEE or thoracic expansion exercises, which open up the airways and increase our expiratory airflow bias followed by a pre period of breathing control to ensure that the patient is not tired and further deep breathing to mobilize the secretions and followed by the forced expiration technique, which is a medium breath in, squeezed out through an open glottis. Now we do need to bear in mind our neuromuscular patients are not able to do this. So if we look at the right hand side of this slide, we can see that breathing control can be the normal ventilator settings of the patient. And if they're not on ventilatory support and they fatigue, we may need to consider providing ventilatory support. Our thoracic expansion exercises can be augmented by changing the volume or the pressure on our ventilator. And then we must think of an alternative technique to enhance cough or the final expiratory component. But we can use this technique to mobilize secretions towards the central airways. And this is also the same when we look at autogenic drainage. Autogenic drainage is a technique that aims to achieve higher expiratory flows by narrowing the airway through an open glottis followed by a forced expiration. The slow deep inspirations with inspiratory holds will help at a low lung volume so when we breathe out completely to a low lung volume and breathe in and out at this level through an open glottis, we'll unstick the secretions. We can come up to a mid lung volume and collect the secretions and then we can breathe at a high lung volume to clear them. Now, obviously, our neuromuscular patients can't do that themselves. And so what we can look at is holding them or strapping them either manually or with straps in the position. And this is an example of that. So they're having ventilatory support and as they breathe out, they're being held in a lower lung volume, collecting the secretions until they move and then they can come up to a mid lung volume and then a high lung volume. And if you feel that the secretions have moved back down, you can repeat and go back down into a lower lung volume. All the time collecting the secretions so that they can then be cleared with cough augmentation techniques. We also have the facility to use high frequency oscillation therapy. The oscillations will allow the air to get behind the mucus. Some techniques will also allow a peak expiratory pressure to be held within the airways, which will help to prevent collapse and keep them open, allowing the expiratory airflow bias to move the secretions further into the central airways. So the oscillatory therapy will prevent airway collapse. It's also aiming to increase our expiratory airflow bias and has been shown to increase airway clearance in some patients. The vibrations may also have an effect on loosening secretions. There are various devices and this is by no means all of them, but some will involve a jacket that goes around the chest or a caress in the second picture down, or the oscillatory airflow may be delivered at the mouth via a mask or a mouthpiece, as in intrapulmonary percussive ventilation. When we look at our neuromuscular patients, we have developed the evidence base from looking at what happens in normal people. So Calvary some years ago showed that it decreased spontaneous minute ventilation, but there was a maintenance of normal oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. So it didn't cause any ventilatory impairment. And that gave us the confidence to roll the technique out into other patient groups. 
In a subset of patients with ALS, it was shown to give decreased fatigue and dyspnea compared to the untreated group. And when we look at high frequency chest wall oscillation in a group of neuromuscular patients, there was an increased adherence to treatment compared to conventional physiotherapy, which was percussion, shaking and postural drainage. And that this led to decreased hospitalizations and requirements for antibiotics. In a larger group of patients, 426, that had neuromuscular disease, who received chest wall oscillation, they looked at the year before provision of the device to the year post based on a cost, um, based on a tariff basis for what healthcare needs were required. And that they showed that there was a decrease in hospital admissions due to respiratory tract infections and that this produced a significant cost saving. And there was no difference between other techniques started and there was a presumption that the patients were stable and that there wasn't just an improvement in care. And in a small group of patients with tracheostomies, what happened was that they tried to look at whether IPV or high frequency chest wall oscillation was more superior and that they showed that if you look and treat with IPV, it seemed to be more effective at decreasing hospitalizations in this patient group compared to high frequency chest wall oscillations. From the workshop, we looked at how much care and how much effort was required to perform the techniques. So we looked at, does the patient need to cooperate with the technique? Can we use the technique if they're fatigued? Is it possible to do in infants, children, individuals with tracheostomies, or those with bulbar failure. And for all of the techniques that they could be carried out in the patient that is unable to cooperate or may have learning difficulties, it was possible to do when they're fatigued only with IPV. But that said, if patients fatigue, we can add ventilatory support to prevent that and we can use the treatments for it. And all of the treatments, apart from high frequency chest wall compression, can be used in all groups of patients but infants. Each technique has its slight own way of doing it, but typically treatments for secretion mobilising with oscillations will last between 10 to 30 minutes. The group was also asked to rate how they found these, these techniques with regards to efficiency, cost, availability, cooperation of the patient, skill of teaching the technique, and also the type of patients it could be used in. When you look at the web, the further you are to the outside of it, the more beneficial it is. So if we look at figure A, which is for high frequency chest wall oscillation in blue versus IPV in green. High frequency chest wall oscillation was deemed to be less efficient. They both had a significant cost in that they're expensive devices and may not be available. They require about the same amount of cooperation, but IPV requires more skill to actually teach the technique than high frequency chest wall oscillation and it can be used in the patient groups. Manual techniques, despite its relatively low evidence base in red, sorry, in blue versus positioning in red in figure B, is cheap, readily available, doesn't require cooperation and is fairly easy to teach and it may have some efficacy too. And the same for chest wall strapping. So from the workshop, the recommendations with regards to peripheral airway clearance techniques are that we should always carry them out, clearing secretions from the chest at the top. So if the patient needs to cough, we should clear that, those first, but we then need to mobilise secretions from the peripheral airways up to the central airways. Most techniques don't require intellectual or physical cooperation from the patient. 
and that they're possible in all age groups and whether patients have tracheostomies or bulbar failure. Chest wall strapping is a relatively new technique and we felt that it, it, it's worth evaluating and can be quite useful. Manual techniques, despite the lack of evidence base, should be considered as a treatment option. And in the ventilator dependent patient, peripheral airway clearance techniques should be used in combination with ventilatory support. So let's have a little look at now at cough augmentation techniques. But before we actually go into teaching a patient for a cough augmentation technique, it's important to look at what is a normal cough. A normal cough involves us taking a deep breath in, usually to a total lung capacity, um, to, to greater than 80% of our total lung capacity. We will have the glottis to close for about 0.2 of a second, and that there's a strong abdominal contraction, which is usually greater than 60 centimetres of water to be effective. We can measure our cough peak flow. And when we look at cough peak flow values, normally anyone greater than the age of 12 years old should have a peak cough flow of greater than 360 litres per minute. And if there are children and, and we want to look at whether their cough peak flow is normal, there are normal values based on centiles. When we assess cough, we need to ask the patient whether they feel their cough is effective. If not, we need to assess it. If a patient told me that their cough is completely normal, they can clear their secretions, they have no problems, I wouldn't go on to assess it further. But if it's not, then I would look at their cough. I would look for the rise and fall of their chest wall. Is it in combination with their abdomen or is it par paradoxical? I'd want to listen to their cough. <coughs> is it effective? Is it strong? Is there a rapid, um, expulsion uh, of air and if I feel that that's missing or that that rapid opening of the glottis is missing you can ask the patient to phonate e e e e which will look at opening and closure of the of the vocal cords and I can perform an objective measure to measure their cough peak flow with something as simple as a paediatric right peak flow meter attached to a mask. So let's have a look at these patients' coughs here. Breath in and cough. <coughs> so you can hear an expulsive phase. You can hear a relatively good cough. You, when you looked at it, you could see a rise of the chest wall and there was some abdominal contraction. And when we measured it, the cough peak flow was 230 litres per minute. You ready? Deep breath in and cough. So with this cough, it was harder to hear, especially I appreciate there was some background noise in the video. There was less movement, there was less of an inspiratory component. It seemed like there was some glottic closure but the cough peak flow compared to the person that you saw, saw before was significantly lower at 70 litres per minute. So in this individual, we saw a lot more movement. We saw a, quite a, a large inspiratory component. If you looked at the abdominal movement that there was compression of the abdominal muscles, we heard the glottic opening and the rapid expulsion and expiratory airflow. And the peak cough flow for this individual was higher. However, all of these individuals have issues clearing their chest. The middle person needs to use the device all the time, but the two on the outside when they're unwell. Let's look at this person. Sorry. It's always the way your slides fail you. Let's have a look here. If you could have a cough for me. <coughs> so that individual, the cough was harder to hear. I think that there was less of an explosion. E, 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 E. Uh, 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 uh. The phonation of E, 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 
it's clear, but it's not crystal clear, indicating that there is some bulba involvement. The reason why I put this video in is that you find that patients, when they're performing an objective measure, when you want them to clear, um, when you want them to cough, they often find it difficult and will do an expiratory flow rather than um, a cough. And when you do get them to cough, Perfect. You'll find that, that they can achieve it and the cough peak flow was 150 litres per minute. So one thing to say is that no matter how much you measure someone's peak cough flow or cough peak flow, um, what you can find is that sometimes a spontaneous peak cough flow will always be greater than you trying to ask the patient to do it. So let's let you have a look and so you can see what's going on when you measure it. Breath in, pop it in your face. <sighs> cough hard, lovely. What was the score? Uh, 170. And what you're doing is when you're measuring a cough peak flow, you're always trying to get the best out of the patient and you may want to repeat the technique five, six, up to 10 times. So now I've got my cough peak flow measurement. I'm looking at my peripheral airway clearance techniques and there's a whole host in our toolkit. To put it into context, we need to look at whether it's an inspiratory assistance or expiratory assistance or whether it can combine both. And you can find that you can use your inspiratory assistance techniques and combine them with your expiratory assistance techniques to further improve cough flow, or you may look to use a device. But in order to help us, from the workshop report, we looked at all of the evidence base and stratified what techniques will work at what positions. On the far left hand side of this slide, you have the force fighter capacity as a percent predicted. And you can use that as a measurement. The next value in is your actual um, force fighter capacity in litres. And the next one in is your peak cough flow or cough peak flow, depending on what country you're coming from in litres per minute. If the measurement for any of those values is in the green area, there is no need to teach a cough augmentation technique. If it's in the yellow area, we need to think about it because the patient is at significant risk when they're unwell to be unable to clear secretions from their chest with a cough. And if they're in the red area, they will need to use a technique. Otherwise, um, they will succumb to secretion incumbents. There's various different position, um, techniques, if we go to the far right, we can look at self-insufflation via glossopharyngeal breathing, which can cover quite a wide range, a manually assisted cough at 0.5, an assisted insufflation via air stacking, combining it with a manual technique, and then the last two require mechanical insufflation exufflation devices. So let's start off by looking at those that provide a deep breath in. We have various pieces of equipment that we can use, a lung volume recruitment bag, a resuscitation bag, intermittent positive pressure breathing devices or a ventilator. A single breath insufflation is useful for those patients with bulbar impairment because they don't have the ability to close the glottis. What you'll find is that they will breathe away themselves, shown here in, in the red wiggly lines, and that the device would sorry, will deliver a deep breath in in the form of a lung insufflation for the maximum insufflation capacity, and then they will breathe away. So you will give them, let them breathe away, augment the breath by giving a deep breath in, and then if they need to cough, to cough at the end of it. Further support can be given by breath stacking. In this situation, what happens is that the patient breathes away they have a deep breath in and then it's held and then a device delivers a next, the next breath in, held, next breath in, held. 
next breath in, and then there's a hold for two or three seconds and the patient breathes out or they cough. And the volume of air, the maximum volume of air that they're able to breathe in is the maximum insufflation capacity. Let's have a little look at this visually. So this is a lung volume recruitment bag. It only delivers a breath in because it has a one way valve and you can see that the foot, the artificial lung inflates on every single breath. This is with so the I'd patient. Like to pop your nose clips on for me. Take as deep a breath in as you can. Pop it in your mouth and squeeze some extra air in. One, squeeze again, squeeze again, squeeze again. Take it out and breathe out now you're full. OK, I'd like you to repeat the procedure without my instructions and instead of just breathing out, cough when you take the mouthpiece out. <coughs> the technique's simple to use and patients should be able to do it themselves if they have the manual dexterity to do so. If they don't and they're unable to keep the mouthpiece in their mouth, we can just do the technique for them and add a mask. I'm often asked, what is the maximum amount of air that we need to get into patients in order for them to enhance their cough? Do we need to take them right up to total lung capacity or can we drop them down a little bit more? And this was addressed in a paper by Mellers and Goebel um, some while ago in 2014. And they looked at providing as deep a breath in in the solid deep blue line by a lung insufflation maneuver or to provide a deep breath in and hold right up to maximum insufflation capacity by a, an IPPB device. And interestingly, what they found was that some patients if you look at these charts, and this is just an example of some, so on the left hand side uh, on the Y axis is volume and on the X axis is pressure and each dot is the volume that the patient achieved depending on the pressure of the IPPB device. So as you go across, you're delivering higher pressures and in some patients, it's not the highest pressure that produces the greatest volume. So when looking at patients, if you look at their maximum insufflation capacity, it was this level highlighted in red. And if you looked at the optimum insufflation capacity to produce the greatest change in peak cough flow, it's actually at a lower level than the maximum insufflation capacity. And the likelihood is that if you take people up too high, that the glottis cannot close and it loses some of the air and some of that expulsion that you need in order to generate those expiratory air flows. You can also breath stack with a volume cycled ventilator. And this study quite nicely looked at a volume cycled ventilator versus breath stacking with a ambu bag. And that the volume cycle ventilator actually produced the greatest change because the patient was in control and that they could choose how much air was needed and work out and fine tune exactly the amount of volume that they need to produce the best cough for them. A consequence of, of taking in deep breaths is obviously going to be chest wall stretching. And what we also should do is we shouldn't just consider the inspiratory assistance as a component for improving cough efficacy, but we can also look at it to improve chest wall profile, chest wall compliance and prevent um, poor you can, to, for you to, to prevent poor development of the lung. So you will have a more um, heterogeneous process of lung development. If we look at assisted expiration, we have a manually assisted coughs. We have various different techniques and they can be performed by one person or two person. And here we've got an example of a one person manoeuvre performing a lateral uh, costal assisted cough 
and the Heimlich type assisted cough. In the lateral assisted costal cough, the patient will take a deep breath in and as they breathe out, there is a short, sharp squeeze in line with the ribs, which will increase the expiratory airflow. The Heimlich type assisted cough, the upper portion of the arm will support the upper part of the chest and it's the inward and upward movement of the abdominal contents into the thoracic cage that produces the expiratory airflow to be substantially increased. And Michel Toussaint looked at which technique was better and he found that a manual um, abdominal assisted cough, so the Heimlich type, produced the greatest change in peak cough flow compared to the other technique. What I would say is that parents or carers will always adapt a technique that is taught to them. And you'll find that looking at what they do and measuring that can show you the little tips and tricks to get the best cough for that patient. And some patients can be taught to do a self thrust. So this is an example of an individual with muscular dystrophy who has got a table where they can drive the wheelchair into the table and it's at the right position that it will cause the expiratory airflow to rapidly e increase and improve their cough. And when you look at their cough peak flow at baseline, it's 180 litres per minute on average and that increases to 240 litres per minute. So there are techniques that we can teach patients that they could do themselves. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the technique, here it is as an example. Can you have a cough for me? One more. Deep in. Well so you saw the stabilising of the thoracic cage and the inward and upward thrust. And what we're looking at is we could objectively measure the cough strength to see if it improves, but you're also listening to the audibility to see if it improves. So we can combine our assisted inspiration and expiration for the techniques that I've shown you just to further enhance cough strength and increase expiratory airflow further. Or we can look at using a mechanical insufflation exufflation device. This is an example of what the device does. So it provides a deep breath in and you can see the artificial lung inflated, followed by a rapid suck out now, which shows the air being rapidly sucked out of the lungs or the central airways. What this does, this deep breath in followed by a rapid suck out of air, it helps to simulate the natural flow changes that occur with a cough and therefore will increase your cough peak flow further, hopefully improving your cough strength. Obviously, this is a technique um, that can be worrying for parents and for, for individuals. Um, and this is just an example of it being used for the first time in a young girl. OK, so we're going to try this machine. It's going to give you a nice big deep breath in, followed by a suck out. And if you feel any phlegm move, you can have a cough when it sucks out. OK, and it'll help you. OK, so let's put the mask on. You need to get a good seal. Start the machine. Okay, so the reason why I put this video up is it's all the things that your patients do. So they just cough away when the machine's on. And what you want them to do is you want them to let it give them the deep breath in. You want it to let the air be sucked out. You don't want them coughing all of the time because they're going to get fatigued. You only want them to cough when the secretions are high enough. 
And what you also want to do is you want to let the machine take over. So you want to look at the rise and fall of the chest wall. At the start, when they're coughing or that they're, they're just not quite coordinating with it, you can't see what's going on. So you want to see a nice rise and fall of the thorax and the ab abdomen, and then for them to be timing the cough with it. We know from early studies um, from various groups that using mechanical insulation exflation devices produces the greatest change in peak cough flow. But we need to bear in mind that in stronger patients, this is not going to be the case. So going back to our red, yellow, green cough peak flow chart that I showed you at the start, it is about targeting this technique to the weaker patients and the evidence base would be when the cough peak flow is around about 180 litres per minute or less. And if you're looking at children, that would be less than 50% of their predicted value. When we look at settings, in Europe, everyone seems to do it slightly differently, but this lovely survey that was performed by Britt Hove showed that what you tend to find is that as the person's age increases, which is shown on the X axis, that the time it, that they have for the breath to be delivered in and sucked out on the Y axis on the left hand graph increases with age and that the pressure which is on the right hand graph also increases with age. We looked at, at our centre for patients with ALS, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy, what the pressures are with regards to the insufflation pressure in white versus the exufflation pressure in black. And for every single patient group of our cohort, the exufflation pressure was greater than the insufflation pressure and that this has also been reported subsequently in other centres. ALS patients though can be particularly tricky. And I just want to spend a couple of slides talking about how we can potentially target treatment to them. Very early on, Jesus Sancho recognised that there was upper airway closure with the use of mechanical insufflation exflation, and he scanned via CT to patients. And what he saw was that the airway, which is pointed to in the arrow on every single slide, uh, sorry, every single photo, um, at baseline, you can see on the left hand slide uh, of, uh, of picture one and three that the airway is open, but in picture two and four, the airway closes and that it closes greater in the non bulba patient. It, sorry, it closes greater in the bulba patient compared to the non bulba patient. Tina Anderson looked at what is going on with the upper airway with the introduction of mechanical insufflation exflation. And she came up with this really helpful algorithm for what to do in our ALS patients. So do they have secretions? Yes or no. Do they have bulbar symptoms? Yes or no. If they don't, we can set up our mechanical insufflation exflation device the way that we would do normally and see if the treatment is a success or a failure. If there is a failure, then what we need to do is fine tune the symptoms. This also needs to be done with bulba patients. So we need to ensure that in order to promote success that there is triggering on every breath, we need to consider decreasing the inspiratory flow decrease in the inspiratory pressure and increase in the inspiratory time. And if that doesn't work, she would suggest that we look at laryngoscopy support to further improve the evaluation of our patients. So with regards to proximal airway clearance techniques and mechanical insufflation exflation, I would always advocate that you use the most appropriate proximal stroke cough augmentation technique for the patient. You constantly need to reassess and change your technique as required. 
If we look at mechanical insufflation exfoliation, it is always the first treatment of choice in the weaker patients. And you are likely to use, to use a face mask because they can't hold mouthpieces. Our inspiratory and expiratory pressures should be individualized and we should build up in order to achieve the best cough strength via audibility and subjective feedback from our patient. Higher expiratory than inspiratory pressures are advisable, except in the bulbar ALS group, and they should be treated and titrated as I've described. This may be, um, I haven't had time to go through this, but it is a mechanical insufflation, exfoliation is a useful technique in neuromuscular disease patients in the intensive care environment in order to prevent reintubation. So what we need to do is we need to mobilize our secretions, we need to enhance cough, and we'll probably need to keep on going through that cycle until the patient is clear. For patients that have an intact bulbar function, we need to target our techniques to our cough peak flow. But if we're not sure where to start, start with a manually assisted cough, add in breast stacking, combine techniques and progress upwards towards mechanical insufflation exflation. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, in a moment, I will be very happy to answer any questions via the Q&A function. Um, but should you be watching this on catch up or that you don't have time to post, please do email me at michelle.chatwin at briaz.com or tweet us at Briaz Medical and we will answer your questions. Our next webinar is exactly the same time next month, same day, um, where I have been given the great privilege of talking about how to start long term mechanical ventilation. I'd just like to highlight I will not be giving every single talk in the BRIAS webinar series and we have a great list of presenters that will be following subsequently. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle, for a clear and complete overview of the different airway clearance techniques uh, in neuromuscular disease. Uh, we do have a number of questions that came in uh, during the presentation, but of course um, all attendees are still welcome uh, to post their questions in the chat. Uh, the first question which came in, which consists mainly of two questions, is what is the additional benefit of adding NIV during high frequency chest wall oscillations? And isn't this combination resulting in auto triggering of the ventilator? It, that's a really, really good question. And we do worry that the vibrations will cause auto triggering of the ventilator. However, in my clinical experience, that hasn't been the case. The patient is able to trigger the ventilator appropriately and it cycles appropriately. But what you will find is that because you are taking the patient by adding a jacket that is inflated down to their low lung volumes, that they will become fatigued very quickly and short of breath. And so what you want to do is provide the ventilatory support to keep the expiratory positive airways pressure within the chest to keep the airways open but also provide the ventilatory support. And if you are worried about auto triggering, what you may need to do, but I haven't had to do, is to adjust your ventilator settings your, um, so that you're making the trigger harder, that you're putting them into a timed mode and you're controlling the length of the inspiration. And so if you do find problems, that that may be a tip to overcome that. Okay, thank you. A second question. Um, Hovenal show an overview of MIE settings starting at an age of zero. Are there any specific recommendations you can give for the treatment of the smallest children other than using low pressures? Yeah, you, you're going to need to use low pressures and relatively fast insufflation and exufflation time. So if around about one second, you need to have a minimum of that, otherwise you're not going to get equilibrium between the machine and the airway. And what you'll end up doing is overriding them. What I have found in some children that are incredibly young, for example, 
a one two month S SMA type one child with severe respiratory involvement that you actually find that that they cry, they breath hold, they become unable to coordinate with it at all. And what I would do at that point is I would actually put the device away and I would go to using manual techniques, adjusting the ventilator, nasopharyngeal suction, and you can keep reintroducing it. You, the child or infant needs to be weak enough that they're not going to fight the machine and let it take over. So it's about that balance. And just because a technique hasn't worked once, you may need to consider trying it again later. And as I said, completely reassess and, and try techniques down the line. OK, and I think we have two follow up questions on this question. Uh, it's not stating that it's about pediatrics, but there is a question uh, from Chloe. Is there any evidence of the number of insufflation exufflations to use with MIE? Um, so I'm not sure if Chloe's asking, do I do you need to give an insufflation, 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 exufflation to be more effective? And that's something that we sort of developed within um paediatrics looking at, well, if we give lots of deep breaths in, we'll mobilize the secretion so that they're higher when they cough. There's no evidence based for doing that. Likewise, there's no evidence to say five insufflation, exufflation cycles is enough. So what I've always found has to be the easiest way to do is to set it up in a timed mode so that you give insufflations and exflations from if you're worried about the patient hyperventilating or something happening you can you can limit it to 10 but usually you will need a certain amount of either a deep breath in followed by a suck out deep breath in followed by a suck out without the patient coughing to mobilize the secretions up to the central airways so that when it is high enough they can then cough and clear and you suddenly haven't stopped the machine or the cycle but just as they've got it really ready enough to come up but the answer is there is no evidence base it is an art great and then there's another question but this time on uh, it is in the adult application what would be the maximal insufflation pressures you would use yeah, I mean, that that's a really good question. I always start off low, so I will look at the patient. If they've never used the device, I'll start with 15 centimetres of water positive and build up so that I'm seeing a good rise and fall of the chest wall. As the patient gets weaker or if they've got an artificial airway in, the pressures will need to go up. And it's not been uncommon for me to use plus 40 centimetres of water on some occasions. The limiting factor is usually if it's non-invasively is the mask sealing because there's no point in trying to give a deeper breath in or a higher pressure if the mask is just falling off the face. So usually I tend to find like 35 centimetres of water that I'm having some mask issues. Occasionally I can go above that with a tracheostomy. I'm not having so much of a problem, but it's never I would never go in and give 40 centimetres of water straight away. I will have always built up to that for efficacy. OK, another question. And at the same time, I'd like maybe to ask Catherine and Mika to republish their question. OK, I see there's follow up now. Um, the question is, can myotonic dystrophy patients have bulbar weakness? Yeah, they can. And whether that weakness has the same effect as the ALS patients, I think the answer is we don't know because we haven't had that group of people um, st that studying that group of patients. I don't know whether you have the facility to look down and, and see what's happening when you're using the technique. But what you can do is you can look at other surrogate measures. So in if the air is going in, are you seeing sort of a blockage? Do the cheeks puff out? If that is the case, then maybe look to using some of the techniques that I've described for the ALS patients. But 
the myotonic dystrophy patients that we've had with bulbar weakness, we have been able to manage with our normal way of uh, instigating MIE. Thank you. Another question. How could you measure PICA flow via tracheostomy? That's a very good question. Usually what you need to do is get the specific connector. Um, it's not something I do regularly, um, but usually your biomedical engineering department has lots of connectors. And if you can get the right size to connect onto the peak flow meter, or you've got a slightly different one, you, what you can do is literally ask them to take a deep breath in, clip it on, <coughs> cough as best as they can, and take it out and um, you'll have a measurement. If they're self-ventilating and they're able to have cuff deflation, then what you can do is with the tracheostomy capped off, get them to take a deep breath in and use it via a mask the way that you would do normally. You always have to bear in mind that if they don't have the ability to glottic close because the tracheostomy um, bypasses that, that, um, that the flows will be lower um, than if they are able to do that. But with cough peak flows, it's all about having a picture. So are they getting stronger or are they getting weaker? You're not, um, it's not a one snapshot in time. It can give you an idea of what technique you might want to use, but if you are regularly doing it, it it's to let you know how they're progressing. Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Yes, another question I uh, wanted to ask in regards to bulbar ALD and airway closing during exsufflation. Do we avoid exsufflation with machine and do other MAC techniques instead or lower exsufflation pressures? So usually it, it's the fact that it's the inspiratory flow that causes the airway to close prior to the exsufflation being delivered. So I would all, I would use the modifications that Tina has said for the inspiratory component, because if it's not closing as a result of that airway stimulation, you'll be able to use your exsufflation pressures as you, you did. If you are finding on studies um, where you're looking down or you just feel that it, it is not working, then I would use different devices. But it's what I would be more careful about is the high inspiratory flows. So, so try that first and get back to us um, if that doesn't work. Yeah, there's more questions, Michelle. You have triggered the people's attention. Um, can assisted inspiration be done with a normal resuscitation bag? Yeah, it can do. Um, what you just need to do is you need to tell your patient and um, that they have to have an intact glottis that they will hold. So you deliver a breath in, hold, breath coming in, breath coming in and that way. But it's absolutely fine to do that. And again, the important thing is that you're not maximally insufflating them so much that the glottis can't hold. So you might just want to come back a little bit on where you think you need to be. And what you can do is you can just measure the cough strength and try and sort of find out the ultimate area. Usually what I do is I get my patients to roll their eyes upwards and that usually is a good indication that they're full because I might have a slightly different opinion to, to them about when we should stop, but usually they're right. Good tip. Uh, do you judge the advantage seen with ventilator controlled breath stacking important enough to make volume controlled ventilation your preferred mode of ventilation? It's no. Another question that came in. Yeah, no, um, I would always use pressure cycled ventilation in the first instance for nighttime use. But what I think we need to do is look at in our group of patients um, mouthpiece ventilation much earlier. And I think we are missing a whole cohort of patients that would benefit from mouthpiece ventilation because moving them onto daytime mouthpiece ventilation frees up their face, improves their ability to speak. They can be self-sufficient with coughing. 
and clear secretions as needed and it can also help their swallowing um, and nutritional requirements. So I think that we are missing a tip. I wouldn't switch everyone into volume in the day via a mask. What it would do is look to use a alternative interface and, and um, volume in that situation. Okay, thank you, Michelle. When I scroll here through the chat, I see that, well, you're thanked plenty of times for a very informative and enjoyable webinar. Thank you. I'm sorry my laser pointer wouldn't work. And there's there's one more question which, which comes up um, from time to time is people asking if uh, there is a recording of the webinar. And yes, the webinar will be made available on our educational platform, which as you can see here on the slide is educationbybreas.com. So within one to two weeks, the webinar will be available at that platform. Otherwise, you can use the same link as you got in the invite or which you used to join this webinar. Uh, you will be able to replay the webinar uh, via that same link. I'd like to thank all of you that have participated to this first uh, webinar, which we organize and which is part of a monthly series of webinars. So as said, every last Thursday of the month, we will be hosting a webinar and I hope to see all of you uh, and all your colleagues, which you uh, could bring to the next webinar on March 25th, uh, where Michelle will uh, present uh, on how to start long-term mechanical ventilation. So once again, Thank you very much for joining and hope to hope to see you uh, at the end of March. Thank you.